Hey, before we dive into today's episode, I wanna let you know that my book, The Pre-Med Playbook, Guide to the Medical School Interview, is hitting bookshelves on June 6th, 2017. You can pre-order the book and get almost $100 in giveaways by texting PRE-ORDER to 44222. Again, text PRE-ORDER to 44222, and I'll show you how you can pre-order the book from Barnes & Noble and get close to $100 in giveaways. This is the Pre-Med Year, session number 234. Hello and welcome to the Pre-Med Years, where we believe that collaboration, not competition, is key to your success. I'm your host, Dr. Ryan Gray, and in this podcast, we share with you stories, encouragement, and information that you need to know to help guide you on your path to becoming a physician. Now, as I said in the opening, I am super excited to get ready to finally relaunch my book, The Pre-Med Playbook, Guide to the Medical School Interview. For those of you who may not have uh, heard this journey before with this book, I launched this on Kindle only back in August of 2016 and sold, I think, over a 1,000 copies and was picked up by a publisher, and um, they had me stop selling the Kindle version several months ago, uh, many months ago, actually, now at this point, and the Kindle version is out now, Kindle and iBooks and Nook and kind of anywhere eBooks are, but the paperback uh, copy, the, the paperback release is coming June 6th, 2017, and I was super excited. Recently, I walked into the local Barnes & Noble, and I went up to the counter, and I said, hey, there's there's this book being released next month. I was wondering if you guys were going to carry it because I, I hadn't heard anything from the publisher whether or not Barnes & Noble was going to to carry the book. The way that the, the book industry works, I'm learning all of this, is that when when you have a publisher, that doesn't guarantee you that you get into the bookstores. They go, they have a sales team, and they go to these book buying events, and they pitch the book to the bookstores. And then the bookstores have to want to carry that book. And so I hadn't heard anything. And I didn't have super high hopes because it's it's very very small audience. And so I walked up to the, the customer service and I said, hey, there's this book. It's being released next month. I was just wondering if you're going to have a copy. And he said, yep, we're expecting a copy. I was like, yes. And I, I didn't say that out loud. I just kind of smiled. And, and Allison was standing there next to me. And the, the guy was like, hey, do you, do you want me to reserve you the copy? And I, and I said, no, that's okay. Thanks. And, and Allison goes, he's the author. <laughs> and it was fun. It was fun, but I would love for your support and for that in, in recognition of you supporting me by pre-ordering the book from Barnes & Noble, the paperback copy from Barnes & Noble, I am giving away one month access to my brand new mock interview platform and lifetime access to my 13-part video series on the medical school interview. So if you would like to check into that, you can text pre-order, that's one word, pre-order to 44222. And I'll also give you instructions in that email that comes on how you can enter to win one of 50 copies that I'm giving away. The contest for that ends on June 4th, 2017. So with that said, I am super excited about today's guest. Somebody who started in this world, it seems we've had a couple guests recently, or Sarah will be the second guest recently, that's came from a nursing background and why now she is transitioning into wanting to be a medical student. So very interesting journey and some interesting questions. I know it's been coming up, it came up once recently, somebody asking about a nurse transitioning to medical school and, and how other nurses will treat that nurse turned physician. And so I actually talked to Sarah about that in this episode. So if you're interested, if you're a nurse thinking about making that transition and you're worried about how your colleagues are going to react, take a listen and see what Sarah says. Sarah, welcome to the pre-mid years. Thanks for joining me. Hey, thanks for having me. Thank you for taking some time out of your busy schedule, preparing for step one, crazy uh, time. So exciting. Oh, yes. 
Thank you. No problem. No problem. <laughs> so you're in medical school now. Uh huh. But was medicine always being a physician always something on your mind because you were a former nurse? Right. I guess once yeah. a nurse, always a nurse. But absolutely. Uh, yeah. So I never thought. Um, medicine, I always thought, oh, I'd love to be a doctor or somebody. That'd be great. But then I, there was a lot of self-doubt. They say that you're your own worst enemy. And that's so true for me. And I believe like I am a little bit older, so I'm 34. I know I'm not that old, but, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, I was a little bit more traditionally raised. So I thought, you know, being a girl, nursing is my automatic path into this, uh, into the world of medicine. But as I worked and got into nursing and into critical care, I realized I really want to do what these surgeons are doing, and I think I could do it. So I went back and took some classes. Here I am. Oh, wow. So let's let's rewind a bunch. So you sure. you were interested in healthcare. What what was what initially drew you into healthcare to begin with? My dad uh, probably was a big uh, person that. Uh, propelled me into that direction. He's an engineer and always had his hands busy doing stuff, which meant woodworking and he'd hurt himself and he'd come up to me and be like, <laughs> nurse Sarah, come fix this wound and, you know, put me to work. And then, uh, so that started the, the, my peaked interest. And then of course, ER came out with doctor, <laughs> like the original doctor McDreamy's like George Clooney and all them. So oh, yeah. I remember seeing that and I was like, oh my gosh, like, you know, when people are at their worst, we can be there to help them. I've always been kind of a helper and a caregiver. Yeah. So your, your dad, nurse, nurse Sarah, uh -huh. do you remember any specific conversations where you were kind of pushed into nursing? Um, not in particular. I was, uh, not the best student in high school. I, say I'd call myself like more of the late bloomer <laughs> in a nicer way of putting it. But I think that I, it wasn't even on my horizon going into medical school and nursing had, when I was going to school, associate's degree in nursing was the way to go. And I'm like, well, a couple years of school, I'll be able to like help people, which I want to do and, you know, uh, have a great job. So I was like, all right, let's give this one a whirl. So that's how it kind of started. Um, I didn't want to go into like pharmacy or, you know, physical therapy because I wanted to like be the one, you know, nurses, I think are the Jack or Jill of all trades. We do a little bit of everything. And that part excited me. Yeah. And it's hands on patient care versus being a pharmacist or something where you're touching drugs right. all day long. <laughs> exactly. I love talking to people and being around them and uh, the whole, you know, the whole holistic picture of patients. Yeah. So you, you go into nursing anytime during your nursing career, were you second guessing what you were doing at that point? Yes, actually. So my ride into nursing was not easy. Um, I had to like teach myself math. I but like I said, I wasn't doing very well in high school. And um, so it's a rough ride into nursing. And I had to go through an academic advisor to kind of help guide me along my path and like what classes I should take and in what order and things like that. So in nursing, I saw my first open heart surgery and in nursing school. And uh, that was the coolest thing to me. The surgeon goes, look at this. This will probably be the last time you ever see a human heart get stopped on purpose. And I'm like, <laughs> I don't know if that's the last time because I'm really interested in cardiothoracic surgery. <laughs> so I talked to my academic advisor one day. I'm just like, hey, I think I want to go to medical school. And I was about a year in a nursing school. She goes, Sarah, slow it down. <laughs> just finish first things first. We got you to this point. Just finish this first. And then we can talk about the rest. So yeah, that I started with that. I actually uh, left the college after I graduated, had a job, and my nursing manager. Well, let's let's him. stop there. Why? Sure. Why did you not reengage as soon as you like graduated nursing school? Why didn't you just immediately apply for medical school or go back and get whatever prereqs you were missing and then apply to medical school? So I 
think there's a couple reasons for that. I got uh, married shortly after and kind of established my personal life a little bit more. And then I wanted to like work a little bit, save some money, pay off some of my student loans and then go uh, back into school again because I would have to go back and get my biology degree. But also I wasn't 100 percent certain that I could still be a doctor. I was still kind of self-doubting. So that kind of held me, kept me nursing for about a year and a half before I started moving forward. What, what were you telling yourself? What, what were the words you were using for this self-doubt? Was it more being a female physician? Was it more being able to handle the rigors of medical school academically? I was the academics. And my thing is, is like I said, I'm a very non-traditional student. I didn't do the highest scores in school and I didn't get the highest scores on my, you know, most everything. And to me, I was like, well, in order to be a doctor, you have to be a 4.0 student and you have to have like everything aligned and the stars aligned and all that. So I thought that my background wouldn't be appreciated. Uh, so that was my biggest hindrance is I was like, well, I came from, you know, I didn't do the best, so they only want the best. So I'm not good enough, you know? Yeah. All right. So you take a little detour in life. At what point in your career did you, did you finally say, okay, now is my time? So I, I, Shortly after starting nursing, so I went into critical care, which is a very hard area of nursing to get into and uh, sort of master. And I don't think anybody ever masters it. But my manager was there and I and she was just feeding me like whatever I wanted. I'm like, oh, my goodness, I want to take care of a really sick septic shock patient today. I want to learn how to manage that or I want to do this. She's like, let's go. Let's do it, which is not always the case in nursing. Um, there's like a term that nurses ether young. So I got very lucky that I had such a strong um, person and a good mentor for me. And I said to her, I go, you know, I was always thinking about going to medical school. I want to be a surgeon. I'm like, don't laugh. She's like, why would I laugh? She goes, you should do that. She goes, Sarah, I fully believe in you. So it was having a mentor that completely supported me and wasn't self-doubting because I actually found that a lot of physicians I worked with were the ones that were saying, don't do it. So it made me a little apprehensive, but she really pushed me forward and she really instilled the faith and saw things in me that I didn't see in myself. So the physicians were saying, don't do it. Were these <laughs> cardiothoracic surgeons that were saying this? No, uh, it was a general array of doctors. And I think some of them were you know how in any profession you have some people that are burnt out or, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of lines would be like, oh, it's not the same as it used to be. And I'm like, well, I don't know how it used to be yeah. and how it changed. So <laughs> and I'm like and then I realized I go, you know, I'm like, I don't ever want to be, you know, 60 something years old and sitting there and just regretting that I never did something that I wanted to do. I, I wouldn't want to sit there with that thought in my mind. So I said, you know what, I got to go for it. What was the, the harshest thing a physician ever said to you as you revealed your secrets? Oh, boy. Um, oh, the worst part is because, you know, I'm a, a woman. <laughs> was uh, How are you going to have kids? And you're not going to be able to have a happy life. You're going to have something's going to have to give. And I'm like, oh, I'm like, OK, <laughs> well, how are you doing it? <laughs> you know, so the harshest thing was is more like the uh, older, the generational differences with the physicians that were older, um, still seeing my role as being a, uh, more stay at home type person, you know, which they're like, nursing's great. Cause you have the great hours, but you know, how are you going to have a life? You're never going to have a life. Your life's over. I'm like, Oh my goodness. <laughs> I'm assuming these are male physicians that are saying this. Yes. Yes. Of course. <laughs> Giving men a bad name. <laughs> They're not all bad. We need our, <laughs> we need our advocates. <laughs> so so you, you found a mentor with this nurse supervisor that you had who, who finally was a voice for you that, that believed in you. Did you have anybody else in your life that, that believed in you and was able to, to support you through this? Yes. Uh, so shortly after I uh, was speaking with my nurse supervisor about that, 
a new trauma surgeon started at our job and found out that she was a former nurse herself uh-huh. in critical care. So she was amazing. She met with me one-on-one, helped me like draft my personal statement. She was, I saw that she could do it. So it was more tangible for me. Yeah. She was somebody that that obviously looks like you being another female, but also coming from basically the same exact background as you. Right, which is very rare to find. It's hard to find the nurse turned doctor. <laughs> yeah. Did you find that she had a lot of the same reasons for going into to becoming a physician? Yes. Yes. It was a very similar story. And because we had discussed, she said, why not nurse practitioner? Or why not nurse anesthetist? And we just both agreed that it wasn't the leap we were looking for and that we wanted to be the ones to make the full decision and carry all that. Uh, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. We wanted to be the ones that are the the shapers of the plan of care for the patient um, yeah. and be a different in that, in that role. So, so talk about that a little bit more in depth. So a nurse that's listening to this right now is looking at all of these avenues from PA to NP. Why, what what was it about those roles, these so-called "quote unquote" mid-level providers that that wasn't enough for you? Yeah, and I hate that term, mid-level yep. providers, <laughs> but <laughs> it, that's what a lot of hospitals use. Um, but the reason that those were not the avenue for me is I've worked at several different locations. I've worked from a community hospital to academic centers to um, you know in different states and things. And their role varied from hospital to hospital, practice to practice, state to state. And in one place, our nurses couldn't even interpret if an NG tube was placed properly um, on an x-ray in another state, this and that. So the autonomy varied based upon practice, based upon hospital and state. And I didn't like that. The thing is, is another reason kind of why I went into this is as a nurse, you know, you, you take these orders from doctors or practitioners and other things, and you can question them. But in the end, if you don't agree with something, it's really hard to, um, stomach that, you know what I mean? So unless there's like some patient harm that's going to happen, right? Right. Right. Then we're the protectors. We're like, absolutely not. But you know, sometimes we have a little bit more of a sixth sense sitting at the bedside all day that, um, can't be conveyed any other way to certain people. So not having that uh, like authority and the ability to do those things and to be told, no, you can't do that. That's not within your scope of practice is not something that I was looking for. Okay. That makes sense. Was that something let's, let's kind of fast forward to, to interviews and discussing your background during interviews. Was that something that came up of, of questioning this leap into becoming a physician and why not NPEPA? Every single interview I was on, that was one of my questions. So if there's something that nurses t- going into medicine, they need to prep on would definitely be that question is you need to know why you didn't. And it needs to be a good reason. It, you know, not just, I want the fame and glory or, you know, <laughs> what fame and glory, <laughs> I know, right. You know, I'm I'm recording from my private yacht right now. No, No, but you know, you need to know why and to have that self uh, discovery and have that introspection and maturity that comes with a decision like that. And to be able to articulate that clearly to those interviewing you makes, you know, them understand and look inside of your rationale and why you chose that. And, you know, they want to know that you're doing it for the the right reasons and that you've looked into other avenues. Yeah. So let, let's talk about your reasons. I don't think we really dug into a lot of specifics. So a lot of the reasons that I hear from students that are making this leap, even from coming from an NP or PA to medicine is, is discussing like I, I, the, the, the person that's making this career transition, I need more information. I want to know more of the pathophysiology, more of the anatomy and everything else that's going on. Is that, is that a good reason in your mind? And, and what were your reasons? I think that's a part of a good reason. I think that that is definitely about 50% of what mine is, is. I can't get enough. I loved as a critical care nurse learning the pathophysiology of things, but I still feel like 
I only brush the surface. Mm -hmm. And medicine, now being entering my third year, has taught me to levels that I wouldn't have even imagined or sometimes wanted to go. No, <laughs> <laughs> no, but has really that that knowledge and that always that passion to learn more and the why of things has always been a big component, but not enough. I want to actually use that knowledge to, you know, formulate more holistic plans for my patients and, you know, provide plans of care that I'm fully behind and I believe in, and I want that autonomy to do so and use that amazing knowledge that we get. So the knowledge is definitely a huge component of why I entered it, but not the entire entire portion of the pie, I guess you'd say. Yeah. Perfect, perfect answer. Because uh, what what is missing from just the knowledge part, which is all focused on you, is that patient right. care. How, how are you going to turn that knowledge into something that benefits the patient? And so the way that you formulated that is is great. Right. And that, uh, you know, it, if you don't, if all you want to do is learn something, then you could go into other areas you know, but the reason that separates doctors and nurses from other people is, you know, this drive to apply it directly and hands on patient care. So, you know, that having that in your answer or in your heart when you're answering these questions is definitely the right way to approach it. Yeah. And, and let's be honest, in our information age, if you want more information, you can go and find it. You don't need to go to medical school to do that. So <laughs> exactly. I mean, now there's like courses online that are taught at these Ivy League schools that you can access for free. So it's not a matter of not getting it easily. You can get that. <laughs> yep. But what are you going to do with it? So that's, exactly. that's great. The, so it's interesting. I've heard a couple things from you from the discussion about disagreeing possibly with some physician's orders. And then, and then when you were talking about using that new information that you're learning now to create plans that you agree with, it sounds like there's some some encounters that you've had in the past of of some negative experience with physicians. How did you go about talking about those in your interviews or did you try to avoid those types of interactions? I didn't try to avoid those interactions, but... The way you have to uh, address them is, you know, you learn from every interaction you have. So whether it be positive or negative, even during my negative interactions, there's something I took away from it. Even, you know, in the heat of the moment when you're angry and all that. But to take it and turn it into a positive light is always the way you should go in life in general. You know, and I've had differences, many differences in opinion. I'm a Chicago girl with a big mouth, so... <laughs> I do not hold back and I'm very, I advocate very strongly for my patients. So uh, you're always bound to come across conflicts and that's something that's going to always happen in your career. And you need to convey that to the people interviewing you because they need to know that you can work with people and that you're willing to also listen when there are conflicts and try to figure out a resolution together. Sometimes that doesn't always happen though, you know, so those make interesting stories and they will push for those. So when they do push for those, make sure you take your positive spin on it and, uh, you know, think about it and how you grew from it and how you appropriately problem solved. Yeah. Don't just blame the other person and say it was all, no. it was all his fault. Nothing good came of it. The night before. Yeah. He was cranky. <laughs> I didn't do anything wrong. I never do anything wrong. And they'll be like, okay, red flag. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Perfect. I love it. So you, at, at, when, oh, what is the time frame that you were looking at when you finally made this decision? Be like, okay, I'm ready to go back and, and do this. When, when was this? So it's about a year and a half into nursing, and I met with an academic advisor at a four-year institution, and we laid it out. They, he told me when I would graduate from that, when I would take my MCAT. So it was really cool in that first meeting to have my plan laid out like, okay, so you'll take your MCAT this summer and uh, this summer here and you'll do this and that. And so it was, uh, that was the right first step. Definitely meeting with an advisor is great. Were you yeah. able to continue working as a nurse and go back to school? Were they flexible and building a, a schedule around you? Yeah. So there are different avenues as a nurse and 
the one I used was what we call registry. So I had more flexible scheduling. I didn't have to schedule 36 hours a week. I could didn't have to do certain times. So I worked probably, I worked every single weekend in school. So 24 hours at least. And then I would sometimes pick up an eight hour shift from like three to 11 because it's hard with four year institutions because they have traditional hours of school and not everything's available online. So I had to get creative, but nursing is the perfect avenue for that because there's always different hours you can pick up. So nursing is super flexible, but always focus on keeping those grades up because in the end, if you, all you care about is the money aspect, then you know, you might have to give up some of those great scores and that might hinder you in getting into school. Yeah. So what if a student listening to this is transitioning from one career to another, not nursing, and, and doesn't have that flexibility of just piling on some weekend hours? Why did you look at a four-year institution and not a community college that was maybe a little bit more flexible schedule-wise for you? So I think what some med schools won't tell you is, you know, an A from, let's say, a top 10 school versus an A from a very small community college, they might take different weights with those. So I saw it as a way to prove to them that, look, here, I went to a good school and it did very well there. There are ways with nursing that you can. I took part-time classes. You could do that. Um, cause nurses for full time, it's only three days a week. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, they're long days, don't get me wrong, but there are different ways you can go about it part time. You can get student loans to help offset your living expenses. And that is something I took advantage of a little bit. Uh, so there are different financial avenues to help support you during, uh, getting your advanced degrees and things. Yeah. Okay. So I want, I want to, to challenge you a little bit. Have okay. some fun. The, <laughs> the the comment about what schools won't tell you and looking uh -huh. at some uh, higher institutions, four-year institutions versus community colleges, where did you obtain information like that? I obtained information from meeting with different admissions advisors and also from doctors that served on admission committees. So this had been... I'm a big proponent of networking and meeting as many people as possible and getting information. So most of it came from like off the cuff conversations from individuals I got to meet over the years uh, because my path going into getting my bachelor's degree took me about three years part time. So over those years, I had gained a lot of different alliances with people and was able to get some off the cuff information. Uh, like that. So yeah, it yeah. was uh, not something they advertised. Yeah. And it's, it's always thrown around on the, on the internet and different websites and stuff. And I, I agree to some extent with it. Uh, right. I, I think a lot of students, the, the reason I wanted some clarification, I, I think a lot of students will look at two different four-year institutions and, and, look at one that maybe they're not excited to go to because they think it's going to be more uh, a, a bigger hit on their on their medical school application it's going to look be looked at more favorably and so I, a lot of the discussions i have with students are around those types of scenarios of like look the name once you're up to a four year school unless you're talking harvard versus some four year podunk university right. in alabama but Across the board, that there's so little variability um, for for most students to worry about it. Right, and if you go to a smaller four year school, it's okay. You know, as long as you perform decently on the MCAT or have a great background that augments that, they look into, you know, you as a holistic candidate should. Mm -hmm. uh, but definitely, I think that you know, taking uh, more courses at a two year school versus the four year. I agree with you that most four years are going to be okay. So don't uh, go pay 80000 a year in tuition when you could pay a lot cheaper and get a decent education. Don't cancel your acceptance right now after hearing this. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> you. So it's awesome. You, it sounds like 
from the get-go, once you made this decision, you you surrounded yourself with people that could support you and advise you and guide you. Nothing, though, prepares you for starting medical school and, and what that is like. Talk about that transition from going from working as a nurse and, and doing your pre-med classes, so being kind of full-time times two, although you're part-time classes, and then starting medical school. What was that process like for you? So I came into it, you know, you hear people complaining about how hard first year, two year, first two years of med school are, and they are awful. But <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I've got this. I've worked two jobs. I've went to school. I've been an ICU nurse. I can handle stress. I'm, I'm perfect, right? I'm going to be just fine. Oh, boy. It's still stressful and it's still, you still need a very good, strong support group around you because it is not like anything you've expect or experienced before. And the analogy drinking through a fire hose couldn't be more perfect. And I didn't truly grasp what that meant until I started medical school. What was the hardest thing for you? The sheer vast amount of information was one thing, but I think also, like I said, I'm a very social person. And switching from being able to study with friends and get together more often turned into more, I'm living in the library alone with my noise canceling headphones on. <laughs> <laughs> so the antisocial perspectives of, or of, I'm sorry, not perspectives, but the antisocial portion of it with having to be in the library for long hours, longer than I've been used to in the past, that was quite the adjustment. Yeah. You know, I'll spend the entire weekend in the library, no problem, versus before where you just spend four or five hours a day. Well, you asked for that knowledge and, and they I gave said. it to you. Oh, they did. <laughs> Do you yeah. think, what or what aspect of being a former nurse has so far helped you in these first couple of years of medical school, if any? It has helped quite a bit. There are life lessons that you learn, ways to talk to people, how to handle stress in general, because we have some of the nurses have a very stressful job that has helped prepare me. Not only that, uh, I've taken on some more mentorships uh, towards my fellow classmates and was able to help tutor some of them through different uh, portions, especially uh, pharmacology nursing has really helped me and because I, I know the names of the drugs, the dosages, what we use it for. This wasn't all new to me. You know? Just being able to pronounce them is a win in medical school. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, this is, uh, that part definitely helped. And also just like I said, um, you know, when I went out for in my, at my college, we are at my university, uh, within a couple of weeks, we're already in a clinic starting and seeing patients and uh, versus my other peers, the surgeon I worked with said, you are lightning, you are light years ahead of these other students that I work with. You already act like you're an attending and you're <laughs> as far as your comfort level, not my, uh, not my uh, self-confidence, but uh, you know, so that will definitely be in your favor. You know how to handle difficult situations. If a patient yells at you, if whatever, you can roll with the punches instead of being freaked out like, oh my gosh, the patient doesn't like me, you know? <laughs> has has there been any awkward situations where you're, you're interacting with an attending or residents or whoever and and you like slip back into to nurse Sarah and be like, oh, wait a minute, I'm a medical student. I don't, I don't, I can speak up or do something differently here. Yeah. So I was in a room once and the patient's NG tube, which is uh, for the, well, I guess if you're listening to this, you might know a thing or two about what an NG tube is, but it was dangling by a thread and I wanted to like go and tape it back on the nose. Mm -hmm. And I should have spoke up about it, but before I could, that I'd already had fallen out and it was just me and the doctor in the room and the nurse got mad blaming us that we did it. And I was like, Oh man. So there's times where like I, want to perfect something or change something, but it's not the scope I'm in. So I've shadowed, uh, infectious disease and there was a patient there for, um, that was in uh, shock. And I was looking at the vitals and the management and I was like, well, we should probably do this and that. And he's like, well, that's great, but we 
we don't do that portion of this care. We can recommend this. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is hard for me because mm. I'm used to the all over patient management, you know? Do you, it's, it sounds like that would be helpful though, maybe in the future when you're a little bit more autonomous and interacting with the nurses and, and the rest of the staff because of your experience. Yes, it definitely will be. It's going to be hard navigating uh, when working with, you know, other residents and uh, fellows to not come off as overconfident and uh, know it all, you know, try to balance it out a little bit because they're the ones grading you and they're the ones that are teaching you and you have to be humble, but also learn how to speak up and recommend different things in a way that's not coming off as abrasive or a know-it-all. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Do you think there's a, a lot of fear that I've heard from some nurses that are interested in making this next step, the fear of once you are a physician being treated negatively to, by, other, by other nurses because you're now not one of them and, and you wanted to be a physician and, and nursing wasn't good enough. Do you think that's going to be an issue? So it's uh, funny you mentioned that. That was actually one of the hardest things I dealt with. Uh, and actually, as a nurse still working, uh, even mentioning that was a problem for some people. And I had a lot of negative uh, feedback from certain individuals and that was really hard to deal with because I was like, well, no, I'm still a nurse. I'm always going to advocate for my nurses. You know, I'm still part of this team. I'm not leaving because I don't think nursing is good enough. It's just not the road for me, you know. So I think uh, that's something you'll experience as a nurse working, trying to go to uh, medical school. So you have to be very careful with who you tell and um who you surround yourself with, because that is definitely going to be an issue. I think as an actual physician practicing, the nurses always spoke highly of the physicians that were nurses before. They'd say, oh, yeah, doctor this and doctor that. They used to be nurses. That's why they're amazing, you know. So you get a little bit of street cred from that. Mm -hmm. I think the, hard, <laughs> the harder part is when you're actually making the transition, I don't know if some of the staff will uh, – be challenged by that and not fully understand why you're making that change. Okay. Y your, your path, we, we skipped over a big part of your path and that's the, the application process. What was it like for you having applied to nursing school, got to nursing school out working and now laying what seems to be your life on the line and, and just spilling your guts and your essays and everything else. What were the, what was the application process like for you? It was a lot longer than I anticipated. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you think it's like, okay, I'm going to write a personal statement and then I'm going to submit this stuff online and this and that and the MCAT. Well, it, I took the MCAT twice and I won't be shy about that because you know, it's, it's a big test and I wanted to make sure I performed like at the level I wanted to, because I didn't want to be hindered, uh, going forward with what kind of schools picked me, but it was a very arduous process and a lot more than I thought of. And it took more time than I thought. So if you're thinking of family planning or you're dating somebody and you're giving them realistic expectations, as far as how long these processes take, always consider that it could take another year or two before you actually uh, land in med school. Cause I didn't know about rolling admissions and that you only get accepted during these times and that the whole application process itself takes X amount of time. So do your homework on that before you apply. And then also the personal statement, you'll write that thing. <laughs> <laughs> I can't even tell you maybe 10 plus times mm -hmm. over before you get it right and get so many eyes on it. Yeah. Some of the students I'm working with are on like draft 14 or 15 right now. So it takes a while. It does. And that's a critical portion of the application is get yourself across. so They don't just top, toss your application aside and you're just not sounding like the rest of everybody. Oh, I just want to help people. Okay, that's great. But what sets you apart is what you have to talk about. And being a nurse is very favorable and you should definitely draw upon that in your application process. How did you choose what schools to apply to and ultimately where to go? So... Schools to apply to, I looked on, I think it's called 
uh, is with MedStar, MDSR. I can't remember the, the name. MSAR. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> so many acronyms. But I used that to look at uh, like demographics. I wanted a school that appreciated diversity. And um, I'm at our school right now, which is amazing for that. I wanted someone that looked at non traditional students more. I didn't want a program that was, uh, you know, I didn't want anything that felt toxic or you didn't feel at ease when you were interviewing there. I, I wanted them to feel like, or wanted to feel like they were looking for the right candidate and that they were invested in me already. And that's why they gave me the interview. So schools where I didn't feel that I wasn't as excited about attending, but you know, I got to say that the school that I'm in now is like the perfect fit. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. It's, it's good to find that. Was that something that you found prior to applying just from looking online? Did you take a visit to the campus before you applied? How do, how do you get that feel before you actually interview there? So I actually worked there, which is, I highly recommend if you're in academics as a nurse and they have a medical school, network away with that because that is really what helped me out. And I met our chief of surgery who worked with me as a heart transplant surgeon and, you know, got into the whole process with him. And, you know, I brought my concerns to the table, like, you know, this school is very good. I don't know if I fit all the M star. What's that acronym again? M star. Yep. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry. I'm like, I don't fit all the like perfect like numbers with M star and this and that. And he goes, you know what, Sarah, he goes, we are a school that prides ourself in diversity and having different candidates. And that your application is very unique and we could see the value in you besides these numbers. And that to me was perfect. So I think you have to get a feel for the school by actually going there and definitely reach out to an admissions advisor while you're starting to take courses to reach out for guidance, especially the school you're interested in attending. Yeah. I, one of the, the biggest mistakes I think students make when looking at schools is they look at those stats. They look at the average MCAT, average GPA for the schools in the MSAR and the, right. the college information book for DO schools. And and the one thing that that isn't really taken into account, even though it's completely obvious, is that those are averages. And half right. of the students that are admitted are low are below that average and half are above. So Exactly. It's 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 only one small piece of how you should be looking at a school. So I loved, uh, I love your discussion there about that. Right. Right. What, what has been the most rewarding part now that you're on this side in medical school, the most rewarding part that maybe you didn't see coming? Oh, there's so many, you know, interactions. It's, uh, it's hard to even say, you know, I think like one of the times I was sitting in there, my I did my rotations my, for my first year of med, uh, first two years of med school in a surgery clinic, and I had an older couple there, and the surgeon introduced me as, "Hey, this is Sarah. She's going to actually be a future heart surgeon. Isn't that pretty cool?" And the woman looked at me and she goes, "You know, she goes, I am so proud of you. She goes, there are not many women entering this field, and." I am just so proud to see that a woman's entering this and, you know, something I would have loved to do myself when I was younger. So that part was really neat that, you know, someone was like, I, I don't realize how special this is. You know, sometimes you take it, you don't take it for granted, but you're like, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm going to be a doctor. That's great and all, but you know, I'm not, I don't have a God complex. So <laughs> when someone says something like that, it really touches me because it means that I had an impact on them and, you know, that they were, they were proud of me, you know, and it, it makes you realize how far you've come on this journey. And it's just, it's full circle. I mean, I ran into that chief of surgery. Um, that was my mentor at a national conference. I got a scholarship for, and he saw me as a now entering third year medical student. So it, those moments are like profound to me because you come full circle and you can see yourself sitting at their desk as a nurse scared about what school you're going to get into. And now you're at a national conference with them, you know, enjoying a glass of wine together. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. So Sarah, what final words of wisdom do you have for the nurse out there, or other healthcare worker looking to make the leap, but is scared about the process and the time commitment and the financial commitment? What do you say to them to, to let them know that it's completely worth it? Don't ever 
let yourself doubt yourself. But the other thing is, is you're going to be old one day anyway. You're going to grow older. Don't worry about the time and the things that you have to sacrifice to go into it. Because in the end, everything you do is going to just mean so much more than any of those momentary stresses. And I say that it was my most important thing was sitting next to, you know, a 60, 60 year old taking a calculus class with me. She goes, I'm going to be old one day, but I want to be old doing what I love and have no regrets. Don't let time, don't let any of those other stressors get in between you and your goal. You can do it. I've done it. You know, I changed and turned my life around. It's never impossible. Just know that you just put your blinders on and go forward. All right. There you have it. Sarah, nurse turned medical student and on her way to wanting to be a cardiothoracic surgeon, which is pretty awesome. So thank you, Sarah, for taking some time out of your day. I wish you the best moving forward. I want to remind you, if you would like to enter to win a copy of the Pre-Med Playbook, a guide to the medical school interview, you need to text pre-order to 44222, and I will give you instructions on how to pre-order, and I'll also remind you about pre-ordering the Burns & Noble book and what you can get with that. So again, pre-order 44222. I hope you have a great week. We'll catch you next time here at the Pre-Med Years where I talk to somebody who is very, very well informed with healthcare and the policies and bills that are being pushed through. She has a podcast all about reading the bills that are going through Congress. And so I brought Jen on to talk about that so that as you prepare for your interviews, you'll have a little bit of a better understanding of what is going on in this world, in the healthcare world here in the U.S., to give you a better idea of how to talk about it in your interview. So hopefully that will be helpful. Again, that's next week here at the Pre-Med Years. Have a great week. We'll see you next time.